Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. In a much publicized recent chess match, the IBM computer Deep Blue defeated previously unbeaten world champion Garry Kasparov. According to some of the popular hype, computers had finally outsmarted man. But might machines really ever think like humans? Joining us to sort through the conflict and consensus are Daniel Dennett, director of the Center for Cognitive Studies at Tufts University and author of Darwin's Dangerous Idea. Rodney Brooks, a researcher in the Artificial Intelligence Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. At first, most machines merely substituted for physical labor. But with the invention of the computer, machines may have moved into what was exclusively man's realm, thinking. What do we mean by thinking? 20 years ago, people would have believed that innovations like car building robots or handheld computers which can track your mail around the world would have signaled the arrival of smart machines, artificially intelligent. Instead, many observers now say that these creations merely represent faster and more brutish adding machines, not necessarily smarter ones. And if a computer could defeat a world champion at chess, wouldn't that truly be artificial intelligence? It would seem so, but even the scientists who created Deep Blue can see that their machine represents brute computing power, not intelligent thought. And so it goes. Yesterday's science fantasies have become today's everyday facts of life. At MIT, our panelist Rodney Brooks is working on a walking, talking, artificial person named Cog. Will Cog's descendants think, or will they merely be called supercalculators with arms? In any event, many scientists believe that the real payoff from artificial intelligence research may not be a better understanding of computers, but a better understanding of ourselves. Name of the program's Think Tank. This is an appropriate uh, beginning. Let's just go uh, uh, around the room, beginning with you, Rod Brooks. Um, could, could you try to create for us, quickly, a timeline, past, present, future, of the kind of things we have developed within this discipline where we're at now and some of the things we're going to be looking at down the road. 20 years ago, people had told you you're going to have four computers in the kitchen in 20 years. You would have thought that was ludicrous. But you okay. probably do have at least four computers in the kitchen what, in now. The, in the microwave? In the microwave, in the coffee maker. And they're doing very simple uh, sensing. You press buttons, they do something. Okay. In the future, in the next 20 years, we're going to have them be perceiving what's happening through cameras, through microphones, understanding what you're doing when you're in the kitchen, and then doing physical actions, uh, turning things on, cleaning stuff up. That's in the short term. Longer term, we're going to get to have these machines which have the sorts of cognitive capabilities we have based on their perception, uh, and they're going to start interacting with us more as equals. Hey, what else do we have now? We have machines that can, that can read books for the blind. Um, and, you have and, and give out an audio. And give out an audio. Um, and uh, in a few years, we're going to have machines that will uh, second guess you as you drive down the highway because you're getting too close to cars mm -hmm. coming up and that are going to, that are going to uh, in one way or another, are going to interact with you and make you a safer driver. And you have audio recognition where, you, where your voice can trigger certain commands. Certainly. You're beginning to yeah. get that. That's hard. I mean, as that's a reporter, I want a dictation machine that can just yeah. take the dictation uh, for me. Okay. Can you tell us what is artificial intelligence? Well, a program is artificially intelligent if it has some understanding of what it's trying to do. So the difference between a conventional program that would send you a bill for zero dollars and zero cents, which is a ridiculous idea, an intelligent program would realize that's a ridiculous idea and not bother to send out that bill. Okay, we'll come back to that. What, what is the difference between artificial intelligence and what we normally think of, of what computers do? Well, to a certain extent, artificial intelligence is what artificial intelligence researchers do. Uh, over the years, it has become <laughs> a, uh, a community unto itself, uh, so closely allied to but somewhat separate from computer science. 
Um, there are many people who would say that's, uh, that should not be, that uh, artificial intelligence is a part of computer science. It is simply uh, deals with the problems we don't know how to program yet. Uh, others would say that understanding intelligence is a much deeper and broader kind of issue that uh, should bring in ideas from neuroscience, from psychology, uh, even from philosophy, as uh, Dan has so eloquently explained in many cases. Well, most of us think of as computers generally work, and usually artificial intelligence doesn't. And, and that's because it's science, it's exploratory, it's or in my case, I'm a philosopher, I would say that artificial intelligence is, is philosophy done with the aid of a sort of prosthetic crutch, which is the computer, which keeps you honest. But, but weren't there things in the computer world that 10 years ago or 20 years ago didn't work and now work? And so they, That's right. It used they to be called working. artificial intelligence, they, and now we call it everyday computing, because they, they now keep, it works. It's a very frustrating task. You have, they keep moving the goalpost on That's you. right. Yeah, I think that you, now you see in, in software that uh, Microsoft and other places build things that were called artificial intelligence 10 years ago, and still are by some people, and it's in the everyday products, the, the grammar checker, the spelling checkers, the things that mm -hmm. uh, uh, make the documents you produce with a word processor they, better. They do some pretty silly things when you press spell check, but they're well, pretty they turn good my also. name into rodent. But oh, they yeah. spell your name as <laughs> rodent, right. They, but now, mm. you Smaller said that, that a, uh, a, a computer uh, would not know not to send you out a bill for zero zero point zero zero dollars. Yeah, not because that, that case but had been programmed indirectly, but an intelligence system which knew enough about the world to know about transactions. But a programmer could just program that in. You could program ne Never it. bill zero zero point zero zero. And then I, that, I, that's, I, I assume that's easy, right? But the trick is not to have just six or ten or six hundred or six thousand simple tricks, but to have a more general purpose intelligence, something which will deal with almost anything that comes down the pike. That's where artificial intelligence really <coughs> meets the challenge. The problem is that if you try to program, all the, program in all these special cases, and people have in fact tried to do this, you discover that ordinary common sense, knowing that a bill for zero dollars and zero cents is ridiculous, but it requires not just a few rules, it requires millions of rules, perhaps even billions of rules, and it's just far beyond uh, our power to program such things, and probably that approach is the wrong approach anyway. Uh, as Dan was alluding to, you have to somehow build in the ability to conceptualize, to um, have some larger scale understanding of what it means to get a bill, what it means to pay money, what money means to you. Um, and we're still struggling with how to even begin to do that. Mm -hmm. Let, let, let me, let, uh, you'll excuse my ignorance. I mean, uh, it, it is, uh, is what we are talking about in the whole information revolution, computer revolution, is this something, a thing apart from human experience? Na now computers do certain things that we used to have to do with an adding machine and before that with a pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. uh, a a and, and the things they do keep approaching things that we used to think of as, that you had to do with thinking, like adding, subtracting, dividing. Yeah. And now you're all saying, well, that's not really thinking, that's just brute force. Mm -hmm. a a and uh, I don't get it. It's a little bit like magic. You know, you go to a, <laughs> see the stage magician, you say, well, oh, that's magic. And then you learn how it's done. Oh, well, that's not magic after all. Well, uh, anything that's still magic to us, we call intelligent or intuition. And then we find out how it's done. We say, oh, well, that doesn't count then. That's not, that's, that's not really intelligent. Well, I think in the end, we're going to see that Everything that we do, everything that we do, creative, writing poetry, falling in love, can be broken down into lots of little pieces, and those little pieces aren't magic. It's, right. it's the emergent effect of having all those pieces working together. That's what's magic, but it's, but it's explicable and, and w without residue. Back to your earlier question, is this something discontinuous in history? Uh, it both is and isn't. Historically, we've had information processing devices for a long time, uh, all the way back to the abacus and probably before that. Um, in the 19th century, uh, industrial society invented... ...lose because he got spooked, a very human trait that no computer would ever get spooked by being afraid of a human. It wouldn't be smart enough. And here, this was his human intelligence, and apparently, if you read what he said and listened to what he said, he got scared out of his pants by this wild thing. Is that, is that the way you read it? 
uh, it, that may have been what happened to him, but you've got to remember that computer can beat every other human on the planet. He was the only one left. So mm -hmm. wait a couple more years as computers get double in speed every one and a half mm -hmm. years, and he won't even have to get spooked to be beaten by the same technique because he's the only one left who even had a chance. But the other question, Rod, is could a computer be spooked? Uh, and I think you and I agree, yes, in principle, sure. In fact, the computer that... No, I mean, not emotionally. It could be tricked, but it couldn't be spooked. Sure, I mean, no. spooked, it, 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 you know, it's, it's It could be emotionally tricked. Uh, Rod should tell you uh, about yeah, COG, the, the humanoid robot we're building right now at MIT. Th th this is one of the things that's sort of left that we, we haven't put in our machines yet, but, but are starting to put in our machines, and that is uh, systems which do, do have emotions, do have some something similar to, to fear, and at least as a human observer seeing these things, you'd say that it's afraid now, or it's frustrated, it's trying to do something. And so we, we are starting to build machines which do have some of those characteristics which we would, we as observers, when we see a person doing it, attribute to emotion. How do you build an emotion to the computer? Um, it, can, it can come about in a, a lot of different ways. You can have some basic drives uh, built into the machine that, the, you know, maybe the machine wants to uh, uh, see a face all the time. That's something you build in. And when it can't see a face, it starts looking for a face. And gets a bit more frantic all the time. Let me, let me, let me ask this. You folks, uh, particularly you two who've come down from Boston, are, are, are heading into, uh, professionally, into an arena that is in shambles now, which is social science. I mean, there's more and more people uh, uh, use the word social science, the phrase social science, the more and more it becomes a, uh, an oxymoron. And now you're all talking uh, 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 about uh, approaching that mechanistically and understanding about love, psychology, and emotion, and, uh, and poetry. I mean, yeah, because when you have the computer, when you're trying to put it on a computer, you can't wave your hands and, and fudge any of the details. And that maybe that's where some of the criticism. But these sociologists and people from. have been working for a century now with their regression analysis, and only getting, in my judgment, too often more and more foolish. I mean, uh, the, well, the, we're uh, not talking about using regression anal yeah. analysis methods here. No. There's not, nothing yeah, like that. They're using the wrong tools. That's just that's that's just it. Think about what we've learned about emotion in the brain in the last in the last 10 years. Um, and, and one of the things that we've discovered, uh, uh, Tony DiMazio, uh, the neuroscientist uh, in Iowa, has been very eloquent in, in publicizing these cases, is that people that, are, that have damage to the brain so that they're, they, in effect, they're not emotional, so that their they're amygdala, this nice sort of juicy part of the brain, which is a, a sort of a clearinghouse for emotional states. If they have damage to that part of the brain, then they can't think well. They can't, they can't solve so simple problems because, in fact, they're not afraid. They're not worried. They're not like central controller that knows everything and mm -hmm. is the boss. It's the king of all of, mm -hmm. all of the subroutines. It's the right. boss routine. It doesn't work. It mm -hmm. doesn't work. What you have to have instead is a lot of different mm -hmm. semi-competitive parts that have to sort of work out who's going to be in charge among themselves. That turns out to be wait, a much wait, more wait, robust wait, way of doing business. When you guys are finished in a century or two, uh, I is there a soul left? <laughs> I, yes. I, uh, I just came back from Italy where I was giving some talks about this, and a, and a reporter uh, wrote a story about it, and he came up with a, with a wonderful headline. Uh, um, I'll translate it into English. Please, uh, please. Yes, <laughs> we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. <laughs> and I think, exactly, that's it. We have a soul, it's made of lots of tiny robots. And, and one could then posit that God made the robots, if, if one was of that bent. They've evolved. Every brain, Kasparov's brain, has 10 billion little robots in it. They're called neurons. Each one of those is an evolved little robot. It is descended from other robots. And when you get 10 billion of them together and you give them the right organization, I got the same 10 billion robots in my head, but I can't play chess the way he can. Uh, you give them the right organization and you have intuition. Organization is the key. It, um, it depends on your attitude to which you approach that question. It's if we do it indeed find that we can build machines of this type that are able to think, be conscious, uh, do all the things we associate with human intelligence. Um, are we somehow 
Does that downgrade human intelligence, or does, does that elevate the concept of a machine? Um, or, or does it elevate the concept of a human being that that human being is so smart that it can design a machine that analyzes itself, which you seems can, to be even, look at more, that way e too. even more plausible. Uh, but, um, let me just ask something. What is the Turing test? Alan Turing, can you write? Uh, 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 because uh, that's uh, where uh, I Alan Turing go. was a, a British mathematician right. who uh, suggested that uh, eventually uh, computers would be uh, smart enough so that it would be hard to distinguish them from people, and he. he didn't want to have the, the, the actual technology get in the way, so he suggested that uh, uh, to test whether something was a computer or, or a human, you'd want to talk to it via a teletype terminal system and be able to ask this, the thing at the other end, which you didn't know whether it was a human or a computer, questions, and if it could fool you, then it had passed his test and the computer would did, be equivalent did, to a did, human. Did Deep Blue pass the Turing test? No. In no way. No. Yeah. No. Deep well, blue if I was playing, wait a minute. <coughs> if I was playing against Deep Blue, I wouldn't know whether or not it was a. If there was a curtain there, mm -hmm. all I know is it would well, beat but, me. But Somebody but bet. But beat the me. Turing test was specifically holding a human conversation, doing what we're doing right now. Right. Oh, much, see. much harder to do what we're doing right now from a point of view of AI than than to play a chess. AI stands for artificial, artificial intelligence. Artificial yeah. intelligence. Well, y you can have certain kinds of conversations with computers right now. Yeah. I mean, they have to be programmed for responses, mm -hmm. but as you said, there can be billions of programmed responses. Well, there can't um, be billions. I mean, there can be billions, but there can't be trillions. And our conversation right now could go in any of a quadrillion different directions, and it w not a single one of them would phase any one of us. We could talk about anything and mm -hmm. follow it. Mm -hmm. And that's what mm -hmm. is so demanding, and Turing realized that. Okay. Actually, the Descartes realized that 400 years earlier. By the way, Turing predicted that uh, right around the turn of the century was when the test mm -hmm. would be passed, yeah. and it's probably not going to be. Yeah. It's also interesting that in Turing's original paper, um, which was published in 1950, in which he introduces the Turing test, he, he dealt with a number of possible objections to this test for intelligence. And the only one that really worried him, that he could not see a way around, was that he, he worried that humans could exhibit ESP, extrasensory perception, and computers could not. Because th in those days, uh, this was taken much more seriously, that ESP might be real. Uh, aside from the fact that you were, are obviously all in love with this topic, um, <laughs> and appropriately so, what is the purpose of this sort of research? Where, 50 years from now, 5 years from now, 100 years from now, what, what do we get out of it? Th th there's two things. One is we get artifacts along the way which are useful. So for instance, there already exists uh, a system at MIT where you call up the travel agent, the machine travel agent, and talk to it, just not pressing the buttons, and you can ask it uh, what, what flights are around. Yeah, but uh, you have voice recognition now, and, and I, I just bought something for $60 that, that you, you have your... Well, that your that was artificial book. intelligence research 15 right. years ago, which is now a, an artifact that you can buy. Right. The second thing is it helps us to understand what human intelligence is, which has philosophical ramifications, us knowing what we are, religious ramifications, and perhaps medical uh, ramifications and figuring out mm -hmm. how, to, how to fix things that go wrong with people. But yeah. I, I think it's sufficient just the philosophical ramifications. Well, I don't. Um, y you are working making uh, humanoid robots, right? Right now I'm working on a, a robot which has human form, yes. And now, so, so you are going to get government funding, one way or another, let's just stipulate you're going to get government funding so we can argue. Uh, you're going to get government funding, and they would have a choice between giving it to Mr. Jones, who will say, well, I'm going to do my research in this area and end up with a cure for the ABC disease, or I'm going to give it to old Rod, who really is interested in the philosophy of this thing, and he wants his particular machine to s sweat and cry and have athlete's foot or whatever it is that humanoids have. Why shouldn't I give, I mean, if I'm a taxpayer, why shouldn't I give it to the other guy? Because, well, you want to give it to, to various people, but, but by having a machine that, that uh, sweats and, and cries, you can have a machine, perhaps in a, uh, uh, a military scenario, that really wants to win. Uh, that make, can make a, big, make a big difference on what its performance will be. Uh, a machine that uh, realizes when there's something to be afraid of and when to be cautious. Uh, 
well, it's going out collecting uh, reconnaissance information of some sort. As far as, as other uh, uh, applications go, uh, uh, let's talk about medicine for a moment. Um, uh, something we'd love to have a cure for is schizophrenia. Well, part of the insight that we now have into schizophrenia comes from psychopharmacology. We have these various uh, new, new uh, potions that you can, you can give to people and that seems to work. Why do they work? How do they work? The answer to that question is not a chemical answer. The psychopharmacologists say it is chemical, that there's an absence of serotonin well, yes, or whatever but, but, it is, but, and but we're going to put a little but, serotonin in there and then... But then you ask, so what? What does the absence of serotonin do? What imbalance does it create? It creates a chemical imbalance. So what? What does that have to do with the mind? Well, if you have a computational model of how these parts of the brain have to interact and how they have to maintain a certain equilibrium, then you can see if that equilibrium is thrown off by a serotonin imbalance, what would be the computational effect of that? What would, what would then happen? What's, what would start snowballing? And we now are beginning to get models which show very plausibly the sort of pathology that we also observe in, uh, in a lot of mental illness. This, the, the analysis is saying that computers are made of silicon and electrons, but uh, just knowing that doesn't tell you anything about the program I'm running. Is it a word processor, a spreadsheet, a, uh, a flight simulator, what have you? You have, to, it, you have to think of it in terms of a higher level and understanding how you go from the neurons to these higher levels which constitute the, the conscious uh, parts of the mind is part of what you learn by trying to build models of it. That's almost the only way you can learn about it. You're working on a book on consciousness, is that right? I've done a few. I'm always working on that, yeah. That's right. And how does that relate to what Mitch was talking about? Well, very closely. In fact, um, Rod and I sort of teamed up after, after I think he read my book, Consciousness Explained, and said, well, this is the right sort of model. Um, come work with me on the COG project. We're going to try to make a humanoid robot. Like the COG project means? The, co the COG, COG is, is the name of this robot, the humanoid robot I mean, that Rod is building. Okay. That's right. La last question. Let's just go around. Give me one juicy item that we're going to have to use because of this research. 20 years from now. You're going to have an automatic vacuum cleaner that keeps your house clean without you having to worry about it. I like it. Uh, how about an automatic companion that uh, lives on your belt, say, or in your pocket that is always with you, can always talk to you and advise you? Okay. Yeah, that one scares me. I like the vacuum cleaner better, yeah. Um, you're going to have uh, Mitch's uh, stenographer at your beck and call 24 hours a day. You're driving along. You get an idea. You're just going to say it aloud, and it will uh, not just recognize the words and write them into a file, but begin indexing that against your current interests, updating your calendars, perhaps calling up and making an uh, a airplane reservation, or uh, uh, putting another footnote in a paper if you're an academic. Uh. Okay. okay. I thank each of you, and I wish you well. Thank you, Rodney Brooks, Daniel Dennett, and Mitchell Waldrop, and thank you. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.